Today in Orange Lounge Principles class, uh, we are going to study animal behavior because in order to manage livestock or understand wildlife on the range, we have to understand why they behave like they do. So this is Karen Launchbaugh and we're going to talk about animal behavior. Okay, there's really just three things that really affect um, how animals behave. Just think about it. One is the fact that they are born with certain abilities. Every animal has just a, a rim, limit of uh, skills and abilities. They're inherited. We'll talk about those. They could be physical, they could be sensory, or they could be physiological. Another thing is instincts. Some animals are just born knowing what to do. Um, so think about what an animal is born knowing how to behave. And then the last and most profound part of animal behavior is what animals learn during their lifetime. So let's start with certain inborn behaviors and abilities. Okay, inherited abilities. Um, the way an animal is built affects what it can do. So for example, on the right-hand side is some diagrams of um, digestive systems, carnivores, omnivores, herbivores. Because of the way those digestive systems are made, it affects whether the animal can digest cellulose or not. So it affects what they eat. So carnivores eat meat because their digestive system is designed to eat meat. Herbivores eat foliage and forage because they were designed to eat plants. In the middle is us omnivores who can eat a little bit of each. Um, they're, they're, um, the way that they're built, their teeth structure, their bone structure, uh, you know, their physical abilities also affect whether they can capture and consume prey. So carnivores are good at capturing animals. Herbivores, not so much. They're good at capturing grass. So that's inherited abilities based on the digestive and morphological structures of the animal. Another inherited ability is, is the ability of an animal to use a landscape. When we talked about stocking rates, we talked about cattle, this, this um, solid line here, not being able to use very steep uh, landscapes. And this is the data for which, from where that came, is that they showed that when, when slopes are low, below 10%, cattle use a lot of those landscapes. They're often found, they're often observed in those landscapes that are relatively level. And when you get to big, fairly steep slopes at 20 or 30 percent, then cattle just avoid those areas. Uh, the next two lines, the horses and deer, they tend to use uh, steeper slopes more easily than cattle. They surely like level of slopes too, but they use steep slopes. And then that bottom line that seems to not be affected at all by slope is bighorn sheep. And in fact, they seem to use very steep slopes. And that's probably a, a defense mechanism to get away from predators and also to use resources that are not accessible to other animals. So they seem to be just unaffected by slope. So depending on how an animal is built, it will affect how they are able to use slopes and where they will graze on the landscape. Here's another couple examples of inherited abilities. There was a study done by Derek Bailey in Montana a number of years ago, and he looked at Hereford cattle on the left and Tarente cattle on the right. Hereford cattle um, were developed in the uh, British Islands uh, near Hereford, England, so fairly level, le uh, low gradient places. Tarantays were developed in the Swiss Alps, the, so they are really mountainous cattle. And so then Derek brought these two breeds of cattle to Montana, and he looked at where they use landscapes. On the left here, these purple spots are um, every time 
that an animal was observed, they had GPS collars on them. So Derek was able to count how, where animals went on the landscape. And what you see is that they used fairly level places and they also stuck fairly close to water. So every time you see a big congregation of animals, that was where there was a water source. And you hardly ever see them on the tops of those hills. They're pretty much in those lower sloping areas, similar to the country where they were developed. Tarantays on the other, on the other hand, they use pretty steep country, very different than the Herefords. They don't uh, shy away from those steeper hillsides as much as the Herefords. So just because of the, the type of structure they have, the kind of legs they have, they're maybe more able to use those steep slopes and they are less daunted by them than the Hereford cattle. Another study about different breeds was a study done by um, Dr. Winder in New Mexico. And he looked at how Brangus cattle on the left there, so that's a a combination of, of Brahma and Angus cattle. So they have a little bit of that uh, Bos indicus uh, blood in them and Bos indicus are able to use to um, handle the heat better than uh, Bos taurus or the Angus and um, uh, Angus and uh, Hereford cattle. So he, he compared Brangus to Angus and Hereford and he was looking to see how far will they travel from a windmill. And what he found was that Hereford and Angus tend to stay fairly close to water within a mile or so, and Brangus cattle will travel out further. And so um, the fact that they traveled out further, the Brangus cattle had access to different forage resources and actually did quite well. Even though they spent more energy getting to their foraging areas, they did well because the forage was quite good, well beyond the water source. So they consumed different diets and then the Hereford and Angus, and they did quite well. Okay, so now we've talked about the physical features, the morphological features that animals inherit. Let's turn our attention to what are the behaviors that they inherit. Um, it's pretty well known that animals need to inherit some behaviors because they don't really have the opportunity to learn them because it would be deadly if they did them wrong, so they can't really use trial and error. For example, when mammals are born, they know where to find milk and they know to stay close to mother. They can't learn that by trial and error. So they are born with this general instinct to look for a dark place um, on their mother's underside, and that generally leads them to the mammillary glands and the udder. So those that instinct is really important that they know that right when they're born. A, a second instinct is that animals often are born with an idea of how to hide or how to be near cover. So for this fawn in this picture, Maybe some of you have had this pleasure where you're walking along and you see a fawn and it looks like they're just stuck to the ground because they have this really strong in instinct to just stay still to avoid being detected. So you can see where that's something they can't learn by trial and error. They need to know how to do that right away. Um, pronghorn, on the other hand, they, they do something differently. They, um, they little pronghorn. Uh, young are, are born and they're up and running very early, just within a few hours, just well, maybe minutes, they know to get up and run. So if something startles them, they run as opposed to just sitting down and hiding. As far as food selection, we know that animals, including ourselves, inherit a preference for salty foods. We are able to detect when our bodies are low in salt and then we have a craving for salt. That's inherent. Uh, we used to think that um, mammals also inherited a preference for sweet foods, and that's actually not true. We're pretty sure that's not the case, that we learn to prefer sweet things. For example, lactose in the milk, milk, which is, you know, milk sugar. We maybe can learn to associate sweet things with energy boosts. And some animals uh, don't have a, a preference for sweet at all, so that might be a learned behavior. Another interesting example of an instinctual behavior is the example of dogs, in this case guard dogs on the left and herding dogs on the right. Now, they're both dogs, they are both the same species, they both could interbreed, but the guard dog is inborn with this, this uh, instinct to, to keep its herd, the, the, sh the flock around it safe, so to protect its uh, what it considers its cohorts, so, so to, to protect the sheep. It's born with that. We don't do much to train that in other than make sure that the pups are raised with sheep so that they feel like they're part of that tribe or that family. Herd dogs, on the other hand, are born as with that strong carnivore instinct that they really are predators. And so the behaviors that we put under control are just natural predatory behaviors 
that we um, control to make them into herding dogs. Same animal, completely different behaviors when they're around sheep. Okay, so now let's turn the attention to learned behaviors. Uh, what does an animal learn in the lifetime of, you know, as they grow and, and become wise on the range? Uh, the first thing to know is just always remember behaviors are just a result of consequence. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about cats, dogs, horses, sheep, cows, or your children, or your spouse, or your girlfriend, or boyfriend. It's all the same. We're all uh, creatures of consequences. So we behave, and animals behave, and there's some consequences to that behavior. If the consequences are positive, they're beneficial, then the frequency of that behavior will increase. If they're negative, the frequency of that behavior will decrease. You know, so for example, if you if an animal uh, comes into a, a pen that there's a corral and when they get there there's a lot of nice food for them in 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 um, troughs well then they're more likely when they walk by the pass uh, by the corral to just get in and look for food on the other hand if they go in the corral and they get harassed by herd dogs and electric shock um, sticks etc then they're really not going to be likely to go in that corral when they walk by it the next time. So that behavior is going to decrease. There are actually four learning paradigms. There's four ways that you could um, increase or decrease behavior. And the first would be, uh, I need to think of examples of each of these. What could you do to increase a behavior by giving an animal some good consequences after they perform the behavior? The other thing you could do is to decrease some bad consequences if they do that behavior. Um, so, you know, this is easy. Um, cattle uh, come to the to a horn when the horn is uh, on a feed truck is blaring because they're they're being called to food. So when they respond to that horn by coming over to the feed truck, they are given a reward, a good consequence of food. An example of increasing a behavior by removing a bad consequence. That's a tough one, but I would I, I think about horses. When you've got a saddle on them, they, they'd like to get the saddle off. And if every time they move when you're trying to take the saddle off, if you just stop, they'll pretty soon learn that the way to get the way to get that saddle off or remove that bad consequence is just to stand still. So you're teaching the animal to stand still by removing a bad consequence. Okay, now let's think about decreasing behaviors. How do you stop behaviors? Um, one is that you could apply bad consequences. Um, every time the, let's see, I'm trying to think of an example on the range. Uh, let's think about herd dogs. Um, every time that they go after the sheep when they're not supposed to, you could um, use electric shock collar on them. That's a common uh, item used for training dogs. If they're going towards the sheep when they're not supposed to, if you shock them, that should decrease that behavior. You could also decrease the behavior by removing a good consequence. So if an animal isn't doing what you want them to do, you just, you don't feed them, you don't reward them, you don't give them a nice place to be. So you, you make a place uncomfortable or you remove the good aspects of it. Okay, so those are four little examples. Hope you can think of some more in your own life. A Couple important things. It's important to remember that young animals are really influenced by their early life experiences and that mother is a very important part of that. So in these two pictures, whether wild animals or um, or domestic animals, they're really influenced by their mother. Um, there was there's been a lot of research done on this out of the um, university, or I'm sorry, out of Utah State University. And this picture is from Beth Burrett, where young animals, when they're starting to learn to eat, you'll see that they eat right nose to nose to their mom. So they're really trying to to um, learn what she's eating. And it turns out that mothers are very influential in showing their young what to eat. This is a really cool study that was done to show the power of, um, of mother in helping animals learn what to eat. It was, this one was done in Australia quite some time ago by Dr. Green. And what he did is he took three groups of lambs. One he introduced to wheat with their mother. So he put wheat in pans for one hour a day for five days. And they, he gave lambs and their mothers access to that wheat. Of course, mothers liked wheat because it was familiar to them. So they showed their lambs how to eat, or at least the lambs were right there when they were eating. Another group of lambs received wheat when they were very young, six weeks of age, for one hour a day for five days, but mom wasn't there. The third group of lambs got no wheat and no mom. So they just were the control and they just uh, had time out. 
And then the lambs went out to graze in the outback and they grazed uh, a whole for nearly three years and there was no wheat. They never encountered wheat during that time. So when they were almost three years old, they came back to headquarters and uh, Dr. Green asked the sheep, how much do you like wheat? So he put the sheep from these three groups that had grown up now and he gave those uh, now mature animals wheat. And what did he find? Well, first of all, when they were three months old, uh, they, at, they ate um, with their mothers, they ate quite a bit of wheat. They learned to eat wheat. If they were alone, they ate a little bit, but they didn't eat much wheat at all. And then of course, those that had no exposure, the control lambs, they never had wheat. Then three years later, what happened? Well, three years later, when they brought them back into the pens, the ones that had had wheat with their mother took up right away and said, oh, wheat, we've had this before, even though it was three years earlier and they had only had five days of exposure to it. They remembered the food. The lambs that had had it alone ate a little bit, but not really much more at all than those that had had no exposure at all to wheat. So the bottom line is lambs learn a lot from their mother and they remember what they learned for quite some time. So early life um, experience is influential and preferences are formed when animals are young. And so, you know, this is an important part of how an animal grows up learning what to eat. This was a study that was done by Dr. Uh, Roberto Distill and Fred Provenza at Utah State University. It's, it's kind of just an, a good demonstration of this um, example of how important early life experience is. So Roberto had a bunch of goats and at six weeks of age, he took half of the goats and he said, you will be experienced. And he sent those goats to Southern Utah onto Black Brush Range, which is uh, the plant that's in this picture here. It's kind of a, a knobby plant with very few leaves and it's got a lot of tannins in it. But he raised them with their mother on Black Brush Range. The inexperienced lambs were just given alfalfa um, pellets in a feedlot right near uh, Logan, Utah. So they said they were there. And for um, 20 weeks, they either grazed on the range or in the feedlot. And they were weaned at 26 six weeks of age. They were given a couple weeks to overcome the weaning. And then Roberto did what I call an all you can eat black brush trial. He put them in pens at week 28 and he asked them, How much black brush do you like? And the results are uh, first of all, he gave them a few days to get experienced with the food, and then he did a seven-day trial. And what he found was it's pretty dramatic that the, the goats that had had experience ate three times the amount of black brush as the goats that didn't have experience. So there was a little bit of variation from day to day that could just be because it was hot or cold or some barometric pressure, but basically it was really consistent that experienced animals ate nearly three times more than inexperienced. This was the first segment of this trial. I'll just let you know that, that they, they, Roberto did this a couple more times later in the summer. And in every time that he did it, the experienced goats always ate more than the inexperienced. Um, I don't know how long it would have taken before the animals, before there was no difference between the group. Um, each time it did decrease a bit, but the experienced goats always ate more. Um, so now it, it would be good to just go ahead and, and take some time and look at this video online and uh, let's see if we can get it uh, checked up here. So now we know that animals learn from consequences and that can be positive or negative and we know that um, early life experiences are very important. Uh, let's think about that in the case of food. Now when an animal eats a plant they have a digestive consequence or digestive feedback the food either makes them feel better or worse they either get an energy boost um, or they start to feel uh, you know more um, homeostasis like having water um, makes you feel sort of better or they start to feel worse maybe sick or maybe just not as satisfied the foods that make you feel better you form a preference for foods that um, make you feel worse you form an aversion for surely all of you in your life have foods that you prefer you might think about them and Think about when you eat them that you do feel better for a number of reasons and then there's other foods that you just don't want to touch because at least at one point in your life you ate it and it made you feel bad and now you have an aversion to it so i'm not going to ask you to describe these but almost everybody has some preferences and aversions 
let's fo focus first on aversions. Uh, the idea is that you eat something, it makes you feel bad, and then you quit eating it. And Beth Burrett, um, a researcher from Utah State University, did a cool experiment where she fed uh, sheep on uh, mountain mahogany, which is a perfectly good sheep food. It's a shrub that's you know, very leafy and sheep-like. It. So she fed two groups of sheep on uh, mountain mahogany, and then one group got lithium chloride. And lithium chloride is a salt that when it's um, when an animal uh, has a pill of it, they, these are the uh, the lithium chloride was put in a capsule. So when the, when the, Beth gave them a capsule of lithium chloride, it made them feel nauseous. Okay, we don't know exactly how the sheep felt, but we know that when people eat excessive lithium chloride, it makes them feel nauseous. So we assume the sheep felt nauseous. Another group of sheep, when they got um, a, lith a pill, uh, it was an empty capsule. So they would eat mountain mahogany, get an empty capsule. So bottom line, half the sheep ate mountain mahogany and got sick. The other half ate sheep and didn't get sick at all. They just got the benefit of the mountain mahogany. The results are kind of dramatic. First of all, on the first day, whether it was the ones with the empty capsule or with the lithium chloride, they ate the same amount of, of uh, mountain mahogany. So it's a, a plenty palatable shrub. So they ate about 60 some bites. The next day, after the one group had gotten a, um, a lithium chloride, you can see that they went right off. They ate very little of it. And then by the third day, after another capsule, uh, they they wouldn't even hardly look at it. They might nibble it just a little bit, but they completely quit eating mountain mahogany when the consumption was followed by nausea. The controls, on the other hand, developed a stronger and stronger preference for it. Every day they ate a little more, and that made them feel better. And then they ate a little more, made them feel better, more and more. So they were developing a preference over this five-day trial. Um, we're going to talk later about how to get livestock to eat sagebrush. And just to show you one of the reasons that animals don't eat sagebrush is because it must make them sick in some way, because we did an experiment, one of my graduate students and I, down at um, Dubois at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. And we had one group of animals that had uh, a ground um, straw, a, a ground uh, hay feed, and then we mixed in no sagebrush, 10% sagebrush, 20% sagebrush, or 30% sagebrush. And you can see from the results that when there was no sagebrush, they ate as much as we gave them. When there was 10% sagebrush, they ate left, and then 20% less, and then 30% they ate even less. So there's something about sagebrush that is causing animals perhaps to get sick and simply limit their intake of sagebrush and in that diet. So turn, let's turn the tide now and talk about preferences. How are preferences formed? When an animal eats something, gets an energy boost or starts to feel better, it forms a preference. So take a look at this video, click the link and watch the video. So how do animals form preferences for food? Um, how would you create a condition preference? Uh, this study was done by Juan, Via Juan Vialba of Utah State University and it was kind of a cool and simple study that was really um, just made it clear that we can uh, understand why animals form preferences. So he had two groups of sheep, and one group he gave different flavors of straw. On the one one group, when they got apple flavored straw, they would get um, a, a starch feedback. The other group, when they got um, maple flavored straw, they'd get feedback. So each group got one flavor of straw, either maple or apple, and one of the flavors was associated with str with starch that they put right into their rumen with a tube. They gavaged it into the rumen. And when they ate the other flavor, they would get um, a control, just some water in their rumen. And so Juan was asking them, do you like the straw that was associated with starch or water, or do you don't, not care either way? And what he found was really rapidly within about, an, uh, within just about a week, nine days into the trial, the animals preferred the flavor that was associated with the flavor that when they ate it, they got straw. So it didn't matter it was apple or maple, but whichever flavor they had eaten, and then they got starch in their rumen, which is an energy boost, they would form a preference for that flavor. And then, you know, another week later, another week later, until a, even a month later, it was really strong preference then. They formed a strong preference for the flavor that was paired with the energy feedback. Now, I told you I was going to ask you about how do, could we get animals to eat more sagebrush. We know that it has some terpenes in it that obviously make the animals sick. They will avoid terpenes when we fed it to them in a ration diet. 
But what would we do if we wanted to get sheep, in this case, to eat more sagebrush? So think about that for a second. Based on these principles of animal behavior, what could you do? Well, here's some things we know. One is that a lot of times people would say, well, just force them onto it. But if it's something that makes them sick, that might not be the thing to do. What we might want to do rather than force them onto it is entice them onto it. So this is question and this example is meant to talk about nutrient and toxin interactions. And what we see here is uh, when the folks, some researchers from Utah State University, uh, Roger Banner and Beth uh, Burrett among them, when they fed sheep sagebrush in a pen, the ones that had no supplement that just, just had the sagebrush didn't eat very much, about 400 grams. However, when they received an energy and protein supplement, uh, they ate more. And it's probably because that supplement helped those sheep de detoxify the terpenes in sagebrush. So it sort of negated the negative effects of sagebrush. And goats were a little bit more enhanced. Even goats ate more than sheep. And the supplement helped them also to eat the sagebrush. And the reason goats ate more than sheep probably has to do with the fact that they have larger livers per unit of body size, so there's a little bit more able naturally to, um, to deal with the terpenes and sagebrush. So goats often eat more shrubs than sheep do, probably because of their digestive and detoxification systems. Okay, well that's all fine and good, but we don't want to get sheep to eat more sagebrush in pens. We need them to eat more sagebrush out on the range so that we might be able to use sheep as a management, sheep or goats, as a management um, practice to manage the abundance of sagebrush. Say so thin it out when it's a little too thick, when we'd like to rejuvenate a sagebrush stand. That would be when we might want to use animals. So does this work on the range? So uh, Roger and Beth took some animals to the field and here's what they found. It's cool. They, they started by just looking at this percent scans as they scanned the, the flock to see who was nibbling on sagebrush or not. And you find on day one, animals weren't eating much sagebrush but by day three they started to realize oh this sagebrush is palatable and then day five they started increasing and increasing and increasing but the supplemented the animals that had been supplemented ate more than the animals that were not receiving supplement another interesting thing is on day 11 we see the unsupplemented animals having a decrease in intake on 13 and 15. it, it might be that that was a breaking point that on day 11, they had eaten enough that it started to make them sick, so they just backed off a little. So that, we, we can't know for sure, but that's probably what um, is describing that kind of decrease in intake of the unsupplemented animals on day 13 and 15. On the other hand, the supplemented animals continued to increase intake, probably because they had been offered this high energy, high uh, protein supplement. So knowing that, Going back to our question, how could we get sheep to eat sagebrush? These are the four principles of how you might create, say, designer livestock to do certain things in the environment to eat certain foods. One, let's start by selecting animals that naturally possess the digestive characteristics that we want. So if we want to find animals that eat sagebrush, um, we would probably select goats over sheep because we know that goats naturally eat more sagebrush than sheep. And if we want some animal that eats grass, we're going to want to select cows or horses because they naturally eat more grass than sheep or goats. Then um, among animals, there's a lot of variation. So if we wanted to um, develop a whole uh, flock of animals, for example, a flock of sheep that ate a lot of leafy spurge, we can look at all of those animals in a flock, find the animals that eat a lot, and breed those ewes that eat a lot of leafy spurge with rams that eat a lot of leafy spurge and over time we could develop a whole flock of animals that eat more and more leafy spurge because some of um, what animals uh, need to digest foods are inherited abilities so breeding animals could enhance that there's some really cool work being done in texas where they're using goats and they've got one herd of goats that are low juniper eaters and one that are high juniper eaters and every year they look among the, the herd and they find animals that eat a lot of juniper and they breed those to other animals that eat a lot of juniper. So they're kind of moving towards a super juniper eating goat herd and it's going really well. They're a few years into the study but they already have a really two really distinct groups of goats, some that eat juniper readily and some that don't. So that's all based on just inherited abilities. 
Another might be uh, some prescribed early life dietary experiences. Remember we said that animals are very influenced by their early life experiences. So if you want animals to eat something in the environment, you probably want to give them experience early in life. So again, let's go with that. Uh, we're trying, if we're trying to create a group of sheep that eat sagebrush, we certainly would want to give them exposure to sagebrush early in life. And then the last point is that we might offer animals nutrients or pharmaceutical resources to aid in digestion and detoxification. So again, thinking about that sagebrush experiment, when animals had a high energy, high protein supplement, they ate more sagebrush. Another plant that has terpenes in it is juniper. So in Texas, they've also found that using goats to eat juniper is more effective when those goats get a protein supplement, that they'll eat more than if they don't have a protein supplement. So all of those are just pieces that we could put together to create animals to do very specific things in the environment in terms of what foods they eat. If you want to know more about any of these topics, I really recommend you go to behave.net. It's a group of scientists that are studying animal behavior, including myself. And we have on that website fact sheets, videos, scientific information, just things that will help you learn more about how animals behave in the environment.